very good evening to all of you uh, those who have logged in from india and good morning to those from us and uh, western part of the world uh, so we are here for a very interesting discussion on security dialogue i mean security is a very critical point at this point of time and we all know what's happening in europe and the unrest that is going on uh we really hope that gets sorted at the earliest uh we have a very uh, distinguished panel here today and i'm privileged to um briefly introduce them and um to put them on the roles so uh first i would like to uh, introduce uh, lieutenant general prakash menon uh dr menon is presently the director director of uh, strategic studies program at takshashila institute uh he is also associated with transdisciplinary university and uh, national institute of advanced studies in bangalore um and uh, he served in the indian army for nearly 40 years and continued as a, to serve the government as a military advisor and secretary to government of india in the national security council secretary um he's author of uh, many books like uh, strategy trap india and pakistan under nuclear shadow a very interesting book and he has uh, co-authored uh, non alignment 2.0 and india's path of uh, power strategy in the world after it and he is a constant writer and a columnist at the, the print uh, with that uh, uh, most welcome uh, uh, jil prakash menon thank you uh, yeah so the uh, next uh, speaker of course is uh, air vice marshal dr arjun subramaniam uh, he is is a fighter pilot from the iaf and he is uh, indeed a military historian a very uh, important uh, job to because we need such historians to uh, make uh, make uh, to tell us a lot of stories from the past he is also air power analyst and a strategic commentator and uh, of course a visiting professor of uh, ashoka and jindal universities in india and of course he has been a visiting professor at a globally reputed institutes like fletcher school of law and diplomacy the harvard asia center oxford university and besides others so and uh, he is also author of uh, india so our a military history from 1947 and 1971 and he writes extensively in the public domain welcome uh, dr arjun subramaniam uh the third uh, panelist for this uh, program is uh, dr jagannath panda uh dr panda is the head of uh, stockholm center for south asia and indo pacific affairs institute of uh, security sweden and also the director for uh, the yokoshuka yokoshuka council of asia pacific studies he is a series editor for uh, rockledge studies on think uh, and on think asia and he also authored multiple books dealing with uh, geopolitics like india china relations china's path to power and the more recent one in 2021 is uh, the quad plus in the indo pacific uh, and of course besides many other writings so to take care of all of you uh, we have a moderator a highly distinguished journalist uh, swashini haider uh swasini is the diplomatic editor of uh, the hindu and regularly writes on foreign policy issues prior to this she she was with cnn and ibn where uh, she presented the signature show world view with swasini haider and she is also, also a recipient of the most prestigious indian print journalism prem bhatia award and has won a series of awards for her work in television as well in fact she is a daredevil journalist and done a lot of adventures being a journalist and uh, uh, she even got uh, injured when uh, and in the bomb blast uh, in in kashmir sometime uh, maybe she will uh, of course uh, maybe she can refer to that sometime uh, she is also a recipient of uh, columbia dupont uh, uh, broadcast journalism award and in fact she did her journalism from boston university's college of course there are many things to tell about her but uh, for the paucity of time i will uh, uh, give the mic to her and it's your show so asim thank you and thank you so much to uh, isb as well um we have a very very short time to tell a very very important a uh, story of today um when we talk about negotiating security partnerships in the indo pacific theater the question is not just 
about what those security partnerships mean in the Indo-Pacific theater, but what they come in lieu of, what could they mean an alternative to, and how could they actually help India's entire um, uh, uh, you know, theater of threats, if you like, or Indi India's entire uh, security theater in that sense. Uh, so without much ado, because I do hope that many of you will be uh, writing in with your questions or uh, uh, bringing your questions to us, I'd like to ask our speakers to put forth their um, version or their understanding of how India is at present negotiating its uh, security partnerships in the Indo-Pacific theater. But of course, nothing is without the context of today of the uh, uh, conflict we are seeing in the other theater in Europe. Is it too far away to make a difference or is it in fact very pertinent uh, to what we are discussing today? So if I could start really with Air Vice Marshal Arjun Subramanian, um, and if you could give us your sense of where you think these partnerships are headed, where are the greatest challenges for India as well? Uh, and then we'd like to take the discussion forward once uh, each of you has spoken. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suhasini. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you to the ISB uh, for uh, including a security dimension uh, in, in this particular dialogue, which really, which really highlights the fact that we live in difficult times. Now, I have a tough act to follow after that really heavyweight discussion with uh, uh, Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon. But nevertheless, uh, I'm delighted to share some perspectives on India's likely military posture vis-a-vis -vis China in the Indo-Pacific against the backdrop of the ongoing crisis in Ukraine and the inevitable upheaval that it will cause in old alliances and partnerships and the creation of new ones. I will also reiterate that no Indo-Pacific military strategy for India can be spoken about without weaving in the military situation along India's northern borders along the line of actual control. The two actually are now conjoined twins. Also, I would like to reiterate that the views that I express are my own and do not reflect the views of either the NDC, uh, the services or the Ministry of Defense. Now, let me start on a more philosophical plane. What will shape the geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific as Professor Jacob asked Ambassador Menon? And while we would like to believe that globalization and economic engagement will be the primary driver of contemporary geopolitics in the region, uh, it is actually becoming very, very clear that deterrence beyond dissuasion and the utility of force has not gone out of fashion. Even though actually what we see is the futility of war rings loud and clear in most recent battlegrounds. And as I wrote recently in an op-ed, the ghost of Thucydides actually roams the world, proliferating the paradigm of fear, honor, and interest in interstate relations. Now, China actually in recent days has decisively spoken like an emerging great power, criticized the West for imposing sanctions on Russia, and actually, in my perspective, thrown the gauntlet for Putin to pick up and convert into a likely alliance that will create a serious dilemma for India's military posture vis-a-vis -vis China. Largely driven by its dependence on Russian military inventories and the compulsions of keeping all geopolitical options open, much like what Dr. Jayshankar mentioned recently of both principles and interest driving our decisions, India continues to walk a diplomatic tightrope and I think enough has been discussed about that in several forums, and I will straight away jump to the likely military consequences, India's options, and the kind of US responses that I would like to see to ensure that the India-US strategic partnership weathers the likely mild headwinds that could emerge in the months ahead. Now, I would endorse a widely emerging view that an alliance between China and Russia could be on the cards, some kind of an alliance should President Putin remain in power after all this happens. Eroding, or, or rather the erosion of Russian influence in Central Asia and the rather advantageous linking of the Arctic Sea Route with the China Seas will be probably the price that Russia may pay should it jump onto the Chinese juggernaut. Should that happen, whichever way India votes on resolutions in the United Nations, it could feel the squeeze on spares and support from both Russia and Ukraine in the months and years ahead. Now, I say this because even if Russia wants to honor its commitments, it may be unable to do so for various reasons. 
notwithstanding all the hardware that we have from the United States, France and Israel, it is now more than more evident than ever before that Atman Nirbhar Bharat resonates as the only long term strategy that will support India's aspirations to be a leading power. In the meantime, I cannot but really help as a military man to reflect on the propensity of the US to sanction, invoking the Katsa on India for the S-400 deal, etc. This would facilitate the Chinese playbook of inducing cracks in an adversary partnership. My suggestion to the United States, demonstrate strategic foresight and do not fall into that trap. Another important consequence for the Indian military is the likelihood of the US taking its eye of the Indo-Pacific ball to concentrate on Europe and Russia akin to Cold War dynamics. Cold War warriors are already licking their lips in Washington DC with folks like Elliot Cohen suggesting strategies to defeat Russia. Does the US have the bandwidth to focus on two hotspots? Unlikely. In such a situation, uh, I guess uh, the United States will increasingly look at India, Australia and Japan to pull their weight in sustaining the objectives of the Quad and maintaining the rules-based world order and a level playing field on the global commons. I like the latter phrase, which is a level playing field and not really the rules-based order, because who makes the rules, who follows the rules? Does this change much for India? Of course it does. But I will not talk about that because I want to straight get down to India's military posture because I've got a gun against my head of five minutes. No change actually is envisaged in India's continental posture beyond suggesting that counter coercive actions will need attention with elements such as air power increasingly coming into play in several enabling and offensive roles with partner support in areas such as filling critical intelligence and targeting gaps. In the maritime domain, it is actually the Indian Ocean region, its littorals and the slocks that will occupy the mind space of the Indian Navy. The development of Andaman, Nicobar Islands and Lakshadweep, Lakshadweep as springboards cannot be overemphasized even as accelerated focus on developing serious and credible out of area contingency capabilities, more commonly known as expeditionary capabilities, must gain momentum if it has to be, even if it has to be limited and from existing resources. Last couple of points. Notwithstanding periodic murmurs from the US that India must commit more to the partnership and the Quad, I will argue that over the last few years, Indian diplomacy and its military have worked really hard to create good interoperability, even without an alliance. Just look at the numbers. Over the last 10 years, I think the US military has engaged in more military exercises with their Indian counterparts than with their traditional NATO partners. Does that not say something? And contrary to what some believe, I do not think that there is any skepticism within the Indian strategic establishment about AUKUS. My view is that more the number of bilaterals and trilaterals, security and otherwise, among nations who share the conviction that a revisionist China threatens peace and stability in the region, the better it will be in what seems to be emerging as a chaotic but gradually multipolar world. Indian air power actually will be stretched across the Northern, Western and Indo-Pacific and will need a real juggling act and high operational readiness to operate across multiple domains. And I think uh, that is about the time I have. Uh, back to you, Suhasini. Well, thank you so much for packing so much into those five minutes. Uh, Dr. Jagannath Panda, you had uh, written recently actually about this balance. Uh, that really is what everybody is talking about. It's a balance uh, between India's Indo-Pacific commitments, and its traditional partnerships. It's a balance between the SCO and the Quad, if you like. Uh, it's certainly a balance between India's continental challenges uh, and those it seeks to uh, deal with in its maritime sphere. Uh, give us a sense of where you think the most important security partnerships in the Indo-Pacific will be. Thank you very much. At the outset, let me thank um, uh, Honorable uh, Chairperson, ma'am, uh, for this kind note, and also it's a pleasure to be with this uh, distinguished panel. I'm a little jet lagged, just, uh, uh, you know, checked into my hotel in five minutes back. So if I'm losing my flow, kindly bear with me and correct me. This is my first day in Sweden. Uh, I just joined uh, with my new think tank here in Stockholm. Uh, I think the theme is security partnership uh, we are talking about here. And I think uh, in the context of India, I think there are multiple 
issues that we need to revisit, um, particularly in the context of the current Eurasian crisis, uh, the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict um, in the regions. Now, when we're talking about security partnership, there is a traditional way of looking at the security partnerships that is primarily from the viewpoint of national security interest or national interest. And I think uh, when we are talking about traditionally about India's security partnership, we have tried to uh, factor it within India's national interest. And that's what the previous speaker was primarily pointed out. But I think I would also argue that uh, there are countries, those who are also factoring national interest along with the foreign policy interest. Now, foreign policy interests are essentially a part of the national interest, but then uh, they are not really identical. They are not really, a, foreign policy interests are not really a kind of subsidiary to national. Foreign policy interests are much bigger and this, the powerful actors, powerful uh, countries, they do play foreign policy interests. They do compromise and you know, factor their foreign policy interest from issue to issue basis. And therefore, when we are talking about the security partnership in the world politics today, be it Indo-Pacific or beyond Indo-Pacific, we need to look at both the national security interest of India and also foreign policy interest of India. Now, in that context, let me point out three specific points. Where do I see that India is really missing or India could probably strengthen its partnership and where India has exactly or exceptionally has done um, you know, um, um, strengthen its partnerships. The first point I think we have to see in the context of the great power rivalry. I mean, there is a tendency in Indian foreign policy or Indian foreign policy analysts to look the great power rivalry essentially within the, within the context of US-China rivalry. And I think there is much beyond that. Uh, when we are talking about US-China rivalry, in the current context, in the future context, we should not overlook the US-Russia rivalry. And this is what the Ukraine-Russia conflict, the current conflict in Eurasia politics reminds India. That let's not forget the past. Let's not really overlook the existing politics in the world politics. Um, it's all right if you are looking forward, if you are looking to the Indo-Pacific regions in your future contest. And if it is all right, absolutely, if you are talking about US-China rivalry, given the fact that China is emerging as a serious security concern for India. But there is also a traditional context to this rivalry, that is the US-Russia rivalry, and we should not really overlook uh, that aspect. The second thing, I think, in Indian foreign policy, what has happened over the last five to seven years, or let's say over the one decade, there is a tendency to see most of the political rivalry primarily within the prism of the United States of America's security uh, interest in the regions. India needs to disassociate its foreign policy outlook in order to strengthen its security partnership in Indo-Pacific and beyond, moving away from the US lanes. And there we need to look at Japan uh, much more seriously. A security and strengthens defense, par defense partnership with Japan will serve India's security interest much uh, uh, in, in a better fashion than, than before with Australia. Even though Japan and Australia both are key alliance partners uh, of the United States of America, but we need to have an independent and exclusive security and defense partnership with Japan and Australia. Most importantly, I think there is another country uh, which we need to really factor in, in Indian foreign policy much uh, in, in a much better fashion than earlier is South Korea. We saw that South Korea just had a presidential election. And the victory of the election candidate, the presidential candidate, is actually talking about the Indo-Pacific narrative, about the Quad, strengthening uh, South Korea's uh, you know, power posturing in, in Indo-Pacific. And India can actually emerge as a stronger partner with South Korea. So therefore, um, the tendency to look the great power rivalry in a fixed uh, prism needs to be revisited. We need to look at the traditional rivalry that is there in the in the global politics, in the world politics, and we need to strengthen our partnership with Japan, South Korea, and Australia. The second point is the nature of multipolar politics. I think uh, the earlier speaker rightly pointed out. There are two issues we need to distinguish about. One is the minilateralism or multilateral mode of politics that is emerging. The second one is the multipolarity. Uh, 
uh, which is an essential part of multipolar politics. Uh, when I talk about minilateralism or multilateral politics, there we can talk about quad, we can talk about quad plus, we can talk about trilateral formulations in Indo-Pacific. And there I think India needs to give greater importance to um, quad, quad plus, and all of these trilateral which, is, uh, which are there, including the AUKUS, even though we are not a part of the AUKUS. AUKUS uh, positioning in the Indo-Pacific are not in, uh, as in, not necessarily against India's security interests. So we need to give all importance, much better importance to all of these minilateral and multilateral agencies. But at the same time, what we need to read is that there are different strata of uh, multipolar politics. There is multipolar polarity existing today in Asia and beyond, and we need to take into account those multipolarity. Uh, for example, uh, whether India wants to have a Asia dominated foreign policy, or whether India wants to have a uh, neighborhood dominated foreign policy, or India wants to have a much more alliance oriented foreign policy, because we have seen Indian foreign policy transitioning from non alignment to multi alignment to strategic autonomy. What I have been arguing for some time is that I think the time has come to strengthen India's pointed alignment strategy, that is to strengthen the security and the defense partnership with like minded countries, be it the uh, major powers in the regions, be it US, Japan, or Australia, uh, or be it with the smaller countries of the middle ranked economies, including some of the ASEAN uh, economies in the regions. Third, I think this is my last point, is that I think what Indian foreign policy needs to look in the context of China and in the context of US, uh, both with and beyond the Indo-Pacific. And I think when we're talking about uh, Indo-Pacific, there is a politics which is there with US and without US. Uh, and I think India needs to factor those politics, but we need to look much beyond the Indo-Pacific that this is what the Ukraine crisis is reminding us. Uh, Russia is uh, critical to us as well as Ukraine is critical to us. What is more important at this moment is beyond Russia, beyond Ukraine, India's power posturing with the European world. And I think that is what missing in Indian foreign policy. India needs to look beyond Indo-Pacific, there is a European world, there is a mini European world, which constitutes almost 28 countries under the European Union. We need to take advantage of our association there. We need to build our security partnerships, defense partnership with Euro European Union. I'll stop here and thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you so much as well for keeping it uh, within the word limit, but adding so much in uh, to um, what we're talking about. If I could turn to you, uh, General Prakash Menon. Um, Dr. Panda has pretty much said we've got to look at security partnerships anew. Uh, in uh, uh, Non-Alignment 2.0, as, uh, as, as the document is called, uh, I know that uh, your grouping got together, wrote about Indo-Pacific and the threat there and said, you know, the Quad is here to stay. Uh, my question, and we can come to it later as well, or if, if it's uh, there in something you'd like to talk about, is uh, can that be here to stay while India is not, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, tying up with these same countries for uh, the, uh, the other theater, the one in Europe today? So if you could just give us a little bit on that as well, uh, and then we'll come to the questions. Thank you. Uh, I think the nature of relationships which India has to have with the host of countries which it has to interact has to be based on what is it when we say that we are talking about security and what does security really mean for us? I think anything which impedes our developmental progress in any manner can possibly be a candidate for a security threat. And I think if you take this larger concept of security, India's interaction with the world therefore takes it to many geographies. And it is very clear that we need to have relationship based on context. And that is why India has embraced the word partnership. Of course, now partnership is much more common in its use as relationship between countries and even between couples these days. So it's the idea that 
all relationships is based on context is what anchors india's relationships with various countries and therefore the nature of the relationship is not constant it can change depending upon the context at issue and therefore india when has always said that we'll never be in a military alliance with anybody but we can sit in the same tent but we cannot be permanently in your camp and i think that has been one of the philosophical posture strategic postures that india has adopted much more than we have arrived at this point in time and and we therefore and i think the good thing about the indo us uh, friendship these days is that over a period of time that friendship has grown stronger because both now understand each other than ever before that the americans can probably be sympathetic to how we are actually looking at ukraine the postures we have taken than they would have been 10 years ago that's because they probably understood india's compulsions how it looks at its own interest and the very fact that there is a whole lot of dialogue at various levels going between both these nations and i think that is the strength of this relationship so i the, the main thing which we have to understand in the context of indo pacific is that this is an area a geographic area which gives you maximum avenues or platforms for cooperation unlike the continental space and therefore when china reacts to it in, as it does and they do it very constantly these days vyangi i think they did just a couple of days ago calling it a nato and so on there must be something they are worried about it in terms of their own security for that matter view not that we have actually made this we have said it is a security dialogue it's a dialogue and yet they seems to be very upset about it so the fact that they are upset must must at least make us realize the value that what we are doing is probably got certain values which we are probably like that's where we are actually wanting to head but the point is that security cannot purely be looked at in military terms that this is not purely the only aspect of security which matters not that military does not matter but it's more a much larger space which can cover whether it is interconnectivity whether it is in the digital arena and so on so the idea of cooperation in security spans today much more space than what it is traditionally taken to be and we would be mistaken if we look at it purely as something to do only with militaries not that the militaries are absent in fact the type of cooperation we have had bilaterally and in groups with various countries in this area the type of military uh, exercises which we have con- we have conducted that's been ongoing for a long time much more even before quad took its uh, gained its traction soon after the chinese in in ladakh so i would actually think that as long as the partners which we have understand that india's com- what is india's view points are as long as we are able to communicate it whatever might be in the public space the understanding reached would be able to actually keep the tensions which arise in all relationships under check as abm uh subramaniam was saying the idea that you can uh impose cats up on on india would actually be a short sighted step and therefore i'm sure that the americans now probably know the indians in india better than 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 ever before in in their history and i think that's a good thing to happen and it it augurs well for what the indo pacific are capable of mm-hmm. and what we can actually do within it in a cooperative manner not that we want to actually 
show our dominance, but the fact that we want to keep it peaceful so that everybody can win, win. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much. And uh, since um, you uh, began, in fact, um, Air Vice Marshal uh, Subramanian, by uh, talking about the fact that you didn't think there would be a change in India's continental strategy. Uh, my question is really, is it possible, and I don't want to set off an a inter-service war here, but I do want to come to um, uh, all of you with the question, is it possible for India to um, invest more in its maritime strategy, in building security partnerships in a maritime sphere that doesn't just talk about the Indian Ocean region and the littorals, as you referred to, uh, but actually commits India, in a sense, to uh, the free and open and inclusive Indo-Pacific, a much wider sphere. Uh, is it possible to do that today, both in terms of resources, but also in terms of uh, the, the, the bandwidth? Uh, while you have to worry about, you know, a 3,500 kilometer line of actual control, 100,000 soldiers on either side, uh, and the need to ensure that there cannot be any more PLA transgressions along that entire stretch and so many different friction points. Uh, so I'd like to come to each of you to ask, is it possible to put more resources into this Indo-Pacific strategy, given what we have seen in the last two years and what China is able to do? Look, Suhasini, there's a, there's a gap between aspirations and actual capability that, 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 that we have in this domain that you're talking about. Ideally speaking, uh, we would like to we would like to relieve some pressure along uh, our continental borders, but does that mean you want to relieve the pressure by putting pressure on China in the in, in the maritime domain? No, I'm afraid that I'm I'm afraid that's not possible. The second is what is our understanding of the Indo-Pacific? As far as I can understand, for India, the Indo Indo-Pacific primarily comprises the Indian Ocean region, and I think. Uh, the Indian Navy, India's maritime power is doing all it can at this point in time to build partnerships and project maritime power in that region, not because it wants to stop the Chinese from coming in, but because it wants to at least retain the influence that it has gathered in the region for decades. So the simple answer to your question in the immediate future, given the ground realities, given the budget constraints, I don't think one can really look at this in binary terms, saying that, okay, relieve pressure on the continental uh, uh, front by increasing capability on the maritime front. I, I, I'm afraid there is no either or, it has to be both, and we have to juggle with resources that we have. General uh, Menon, would you like to weigh in on that? I, I think, you know, when you have the problem about resources and the objectives that you have, that is why you require a strategy. That is why strategy must link the resources with your objectives. The, I, I mean, I would agree with him that the, they has to, India has to have a balance between what it can, it can do with its continental power and what it can do with its maritime power. But let's be clear about one thing, that India's power actually lies in the oceans. That it is not in the continental that India can even project its power. It can actually at best defend yeah. its territory. Whereas you look at India's geography, look at peninsular India jutting out into the Indian Ocean. That is a gift of geography. And if India, India therefore has to utilize its resources, it has to keep this in mind. But with the very fact that our resources are now going to be under greater pressure, and Ukraine probably would just add to it from many other factors, which including COVID-19, this poses a major challenge about how it is to be distributed. Now, it is for the politicians to decide how do you balance this between your geopolitical necessities and your developmental goals. That is why you require a strategy. That is why you require then, which will only give you the priorities of how do you allot. Because you're not going to stop. Probably you'll slow things down because you don't have the money. That's a different point. And the issue really is what we lack 
and probably it's probably there in uh, in probably as a top secret document. But what we lack in uh, what is there in the public domain, do we have an overall national strategy which addresses these? Because this has to be thought through. It cannot be seen as an issue based. It's not about how to deal with continent then how to deal with maritime. To be considered separately, it is about the complete way of how, how statecraft is to be conducted by India. If we cannot think that with the intellectual horsepower at our command, then it is our fault. It is nobody else's. All right. And you're both making a very realistic argument. Uh, <clears throat> this is not something that that one can just, uh, you know, have great aspirations for. One has to really uh, think this through. Uh, Dr. Jagannath Panda, now we are getting in questions from uh, some of the audience. You wrote this piece about what you call India's silent diplomacy, navigating the U.S.-Russia uh, conflict at present, because obviously it's not just about Russia-Ukraine. This is very much what we are seeing uh, is the West versus uh, Russia. Uh, and Professor Sangamitra Patnaik is asking, how do you perceive India's abstention at the UN on the Ukraine issue? It's, it, it, it is, um, uh, you know, semantics to suggest that an abstention is equal to neutrality or an abstention is equal to sitting out of the argument. Uh, given the situation right now, an abstention is being seen very much uh, as, a, uh, as a refusal to criticize Russia's actions. Um, so, uh, so how, if I could start with you, uh, how do you really see India's abstention? We've already abstained at, I think, seven votes at the UNSC, the UNGA, the IAEA, the UN Human Rights Council as well. Uh, do you think that's sustainable? Abstention is clearly not a, a type of neutrality. It's clearly not. Uh, in fact, absentia means we are taking a position. That position is not necessarily yes or no. That position is not necessarily to support or oppose. That position is to put India's foreign policy interest into the picture. And that's why it was a calculative move on the part of India to absence from the voting. And by absencing from the voting means that India do not want to politically say something, but India is very much a power that de-recognizes the Russian advancement to Ukraine, at the same time do not want to spoil its relationship with Russia. That means it's again the foreign policy interest comes into play. Uh, the Ukraine crisis may not necessarily directly affect India's national security interest. But there is a linkage when it comes to the foreign policy interest. And this is what I wanted to explain, that national security interest or national interest is a broader prism, whereas foreign policy interest is a subset of the national security interest, but it is also um, helps the nations to take a position or not to take a position at a, at, a, at a global level. And this is what India has been doing on the Ukraine and Russia crisis. The national foreign policy interest of India comes into play because Russia is a traditional partner. India wants to continue on its partnership, on its relationship with Russia without really criticizing Russia. And that's why the absentia is not a kind of neutrality. Rather, it is a position uh, that India has taken. And, and we're just hoping that by using the term abstention, we're actually saying much, much more in Subramanian. So we don't agree on uh, Russia with the rest of the Quad or the rest of the partners in our Indo-Pacific strategy, because who are these partners? It's either the US and Australia uh, and Japan on one side, or it is uh, the EU, or it is France, or it is the UK. So we don't agree with any of them when it comes to events in Ukraine and on our posture on Russia. Uh, at a recent Quad ministerial, it was clear we didn't agree on Myanmar either. India is not in favor of unilateral sanctions. The external affairs minister said so. Even on an issue like North Korea, after all, India is one of the few countries that maintains a mission over there. So my question to you really is, is the Quad and is India's Indo-Pacific strategy, if you like, even a strategy? Is it a security um, uh, a partnership at all, given that the places we seem to agree on uh, basically involve uh, distribution of vaccines, agreeing on climate change, uh, maybe some technology partnerships? but not much more, and not just in terms of security, but in terms of our foreign policy worldview, we seem to defer completely 
Do you think uh, our Indo-Pacific strategy is actually a strategy at all? You know, ab- absolutely. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think Suhasini, if you if you look at it, it's we are not in an alliance with the United States. We we argue that the Indo uh, that the that the Quad is not a security construct, but it is a security engagement. It is a secure. It, it's a forum to discuss security issues along with a lot of issues. Now, one thing is posturing, uh, and the other thing is what actually goes on on the ground. If you look at the kind of military exercises that that that, are, that have taken place between India and all its Quad partners. Uh, it's 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 amazing the amount of interoperability that has been developed after the last uh, over the last four or five years. I mean, so you look at exercise pitch black with the Australians. You look you look at Milan. Uh, you kind you you look at the way in which India. Uh, you you know the Indian military has leveraged all the agreements that it has signed with the uh, with the United States. So so I think uh, I think there's a lot going on beneath the surface, and I think that's how uh, a. Gr- a growing power like india has to keep it that way because ultimately it's all about power it is because india doesn't have the power to clearly take a stand on critical issues it's then that issues such as balancing principles with with national interest come 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 into play so so i think india does have a strategy with the quad it does have a strategy for the uh, for the indo pacific and it's only that uh, balancing is 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 a key feature of this particular strategy all right. Um, uh, General Menon, if I could ask you now what is going to happen when we see the shifting balance. You know, what was interesting to me at the Quad Ministerial uh, a couple of weeks ago was that the U.S. is now saying that we have higher expectations from China to rein in Russia, or we have higher expectations from China in terms of, uh, um, uh, you know, holding Russia to account. So, uh, at the UN Security Council, the US and, and uh, other countries spent all their time trying to push China from a no to an abstention, which they eventually uh, succeeded in doing. Um, and there seems to be a push away from seeing China as the preeminent threat uh, for them, uh, 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 contrary to perhaps what we in India do see. How do you see this Ukraine conflict, in a sense? Uh, the shifting uh, balance, if you like, uh, between uh, uh, between Russia and China, the shifting balances between how the U.S. sees China and the U.S. sees Russia. How do you see all of this impacting India and this strategy in the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I might be wrong, but, you know, there is a certain uh, uh, sort of traction which is resident in Washington when it looks at Russia as an opponent. And, you know, it it gains a lot of energy from Americans itself. And that probably it's to do with the history of the Cold War. So we are at the height of the moment. And to say that the U.S. has actually taken its eyes off from the China ball would probably be a little too early to do that. If they do, that would be a mistake. And we, I suppose everybody, India would consider it, it to be a mess, and I'm sure they won't. But I, I, so, but it's too early to pass judgment on the fact that the Russians have now become the main. China has gone into the background. I don't think that is happening. The very fact that they have managed to actually push them from no to an abstention is to show that. The engagement between both these parts is still ongoing. After all, if we just look at their interdependence and uh, the the fact that they know that they can't unlock or just move away from each other so easily would probably be a good thing for themselves uh, between both these nations. So I think it is for India, the eye should be on the fact that how do we actually minimize the fallout of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on India? How do we do that? That's the challenge. All right. And, and, and it's certainly the subject, I'm sure, of uh, future such discussions. 
Um, Dr. Panda, uh, there is a lot, in fact, to unpack, even when it comes to European Union and India. Uh, just before the Russian announcement, President Putin's announcement, we saw actually um, uh, External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar at a ministerial for Indo-Pacific countries at uh, in Paris uh, of the European Union countries and Indo-Pacific countries. Uh, so there is now a question of you know dealing much more uh, deeply, uh, improving defense and security relations with each other, um, and yet there remains with the European Union perhaps the same kind of hesitations we have had with uh, the U United States as well. The the hesitation to cut down our dependence on Russian defense hardware seems to be the same, which is that these Western countries don't actually um, uh, go beyond uh, uh, you know, the sale of uh, various equipment. They don't get into technology transfers. They don't do the kind of collaboration that Russia and India do. Our, our, our most salient export right now of the Brahmos is not possible without Russian uh, collaboration. So there is a question from Ari Maslikar. Who says, do you think the EU would be interested even in engaging with beyond weapon systems and uh, seller and buyer uh, relationship? And if so, in which spheres would that be? Yes, in fact, uh, I mean, um, we do have two eminent, uh, you know, military scientists, military practitioners, ex-military practitioners. They would uh, probably say better than me that, you know, it will take probably another one decade for India to give away or to move away from the Russian equipments, military equipments in Indian military industry. So I think there is a possibility, there is a scope for India to strengthen the military and security partnership with many countries in the EU, particularly with France, Germany, and some of the other prominent economies in EU, those who are very good in defense technologies and military hardware equipments. But I think there is a partnership beyond the military and security partnership with the EU exist. Today, if you see closely India's partnership with the EU, it is emerging in, in critical areas like science and technology, energy and renewable energy, innovation. Um, if we talk about also investment in the areas of connectivity and infrastructure. So EU is emerging as a critical investor and a partner with India. In fact, if you see uh, EU's global gateway strategy, which is just announced three to four months back, that actually talks about more specifically how about uh, you know strengthening and concretizing a partnership with the India in Asia, apart from Japan. So there is a reciprocation being acknowledged uh, from the EU side as well as from the Indian side. So this partnership can go beyond the security and defense areas. It could look at critical technological areas, uh, innovation areas, areas in infrastructure, in economy, and investment. So there is a partnership which can be explored both within the US-led Indo-Pacific construct and outside the US-led uh, construct in the Indo-Pacific between India and EU. Certainly, and you know, the, the possibilities are immense. India's engagement with these possibilities has definitely intensified, particularly in the last few years. The Quad is only part of uh, all these various engagements. Uh, that uh, that that uh, that India and its military and uh, its strategic sphere have engaged with, uh, but it may be a little early to tell just how much the world changes with the conflict in Ukraine. If that conflict goes away soon, if it is possible to mend again uh, some of the ruptures we have seen, because of course the ruptures are no longer just on uh, you know on a difference of opinion. The ruptures are on the world order on the economic sphere, where there's a major decoupling going on, uh, even on the cultural and social sphere, uh, we see the possibility of two different worlds emerging out of this, two different worlds with very little in common, and India having a foot, if you like, in each world, uh, and possibly hoping, just hoping, that it won't have to choose. I'm gonna to have to leave this discussion here, uh, but of course we could really go on. And I'd like to thank uh, both the Indian School of Business as well as the consulate, uh, the US consulate there in Hyderabad for inviting us to have this uh, discussion this evening. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Sarasini, for thank you. wonderfully doing this job. And thank you all the panelists uh, 
General Menon, uh, uh, ABM Subramaniam, and uh, Dr. Jagannath Panda. Uh, we really enjoyed, and I hope uh, we are a step closer to the to creating a, a roadmap for the uh, larger scene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.